You're listening to the Elvis Ultimate Fan Channel Podcast, the channel that is devoted 100% to the life and career of the biggest selling recording artist of all time, with your host, Steve Francis. Hey everyone, and welcome to Elvis the Ultimate Fan Channel. My special guest today is bass singer Larry Strickland. Larry was a member of the vocal group J.D. Sumner and the Stamps Quartet and sang with Elvis on stage and in the recording studio from 1974 to 1977. Hi Larry and welcome to the show. Hi Steve, how are you man? I'm I'm, uh, glad we were able to connect. Yeah, I'm doing really, really well and uh, I'd like to thank you for taking time out to speak to myself and uh, all the Elvis fans as well. It's much appreciated. Yes. Happy to do that. Uh, so if you'd like to maybe start at the beginning and tell me where you were born and, and your early days and your music background and so forth. Yeah, I was born uh, and raised in uh, and around Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, that's one of the southern states. And my dad was um, was a minister. And this was back in, obviously, in the 40s. And he, he loved gospel music he loved the gospel quartets of course back then there wasn't a whole lot of concerts and that kind of stuff to go to you know there was uh the music music scene wasn't that big so he loved to go hear the quartets sing you know whenever they'd come to town and so when i was about 10 years old he took me with him to one to one of them and man i'm sitting in that auditorium and when i hear that quartet sound coming off the stage and it, you know it just it just went all through me you know and it, yeah uh, it uh, profoundly affected uh, me just mentally i mean it was from that day on it was, it was all i could think about you know wanting to be part of that um and so i continued going to the concerts and uh you know, I, was, I was able to buy some some albums from some of the groups and um, had a little record player. And so I would, uh, every day after school, I'd come home and I'd play those records and then stand in my room and, and sing with them. And just, I would do that for hours. And, uh, you know, I was teaching myself to sing. And then as my voice uh, lowered, changed, uh, you know, I obviously had to pick the, pick the bass part. Um, and, um, so you know, the more and the more I sang bass, uh, the lower my voice got, and um, so and then I then I but eventually when I was a teenager, there were some local singers in the, around me, and I got to audition for one of those, and and just started traveling just locally, you know, in the in the, in the county or a couple of counties, and and just on the weekends and and. Um, did that for years. Um, then in the middle of all that, uh, I went in the military because I was about to be drafted. So I wound up going into the military and spent four years in Germany. But as soon as I got back, I immediately went right back into to singing with groups. And then one day we were, we were doing a concert in a little town called Fedville, North Carolina. And J.D. Sumner and the Stamps Quartet was on the same program with us. We actually, we actually opened the program for him. And afterwards, uh, Ed Enoch, who was a lead singer in the Stamps, came up to me and asked for my, my name and, and phone number. And he said, man, you know, I've been, I like your singing and you never know when we, we might need a bass. Yeah. And literally it was about five years later from that time, from that meeting with Ed, it was, a, it was about five years. I get I get a call to, to come to Nashville and, and audition with the Stamps. Um, and I don't know how or why Ed managed to carry my <clears throat> name and phone number around for all those years, but he he sure did. He must have been very impressed like, with you. I'd say he was impre- he was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been, yeah. Um, but I came to audition. I got the job and I moved to Nashville and hit the road, man. I mean, you know, I was literally here just a couple of days and get on, I got on the bus and we hit the road to do gospel uh, concerts. Uh, you know, when, whenever Elvis wasn't touring, 
the stamps would go out on their own and, and do do gospel shows. And then, um, then of course, being hired by them, it automatically made me part of the Elvis thing. And so I, I um, uh, it wasn't very long after I'd moved and gotten into the stamps that, that Elvis uh, started uh, one of his runs in, in Vegas. And so Las Vegas was my first my first show with um, with Elvis, the first time meeting him, and and you can imagine, you know, I was a I was pretty green. I was just a country boy, and I'd never been to Vegas, and I'd never seen a concert like Elvis's. And so man, it really it really blew my mind. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, it, it took me it took me a long time to be able to settle in and really figure out what I was doing and where I was, you know. But man, it was fun. It was just a uh, you know, and from that point on, I, I did over 200 concerts with, with Elvis. So, um, I, I think that was uh, ni- 1974, was it, when you joined the Elvis uh, band? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And can you tell me about the, the first meeting and, and the first impressions uh, of Elvis? <laughs> well, that's, that's a story a lot of, probably a lot of your fans have, have heard you tell it on Elvis radio or somewhere, but... Um, it, at that particular time, the um, the dress that, that the younger kids were wearing, and they're back to, then they're back to doing it now. But back in those days, they wearing bib overalls was real popular, and um, you know, girls and guys wore wore the bib overalls. And so, I, you know, I saw that, so I bought a pair. I bought a pair, and so that's what I'm wearing when I first hit Vegas, and I. I'm, uh, I get a call from Ben Enoch. He says, listen, we're going to do a rehearsal tonight. Um, so, you know, I'll meet you upstairs or so and so. So I didn't think anything else about it. And come time for rehearsal, I'd go upstairs. And, um, the band, all the, uh, all the whole orchestra, not the whole orchestra, but all the, all of the band was there. And, and, of course, Sweet Inspirations and Stamps and everybody else that, that kind of had anything to do with the show was all in the room. And then Elvis comes walking in, and of course I'm I'm extremely intimidated the minute he walks in. It's like, oh my lord, it's Elvis Presley coming through the door. You know, it's just <laughs> I'm sure I had my mouth wide open and my eyes were bugged out. And he comes around and he's he's meeting and greeting everybody because it had been a couple of months or more since they had worked, and so he was saying hi to everybody slapping him on the back. He came over to where, where I'm standing with the stamps and he says, and he's hugging them. And then he, and then uh, Ed Enix says, he, uh, uh, I want you to meet our new bass singer, Larry Strickland. And I put my hand out and Albert shook my hand. And then he put, put his arm around Ed and pulled Ed away, just about two feet away from me. And I heard him say, Ed, where in the hell did you get the effing farmer? I'm wearing those bib overalls. <laughs> oh my lord, man! What is what is going on? You know, I've, I've really done stuff. I've really committed a, a, an error here. I've done something that I shouldn't have done wearing these overalls. And then he went around the the, the room over to the suites and everybody else, and, and and was pointing me out to to everybody. And so I, I was, I was like the laughing stock of the whole entourage, man. There's people, of course, of course, Elvis was laughing, and so they all had to laugh with him. You know, they weren't not going to laugh. But I was certain that that I was going to be on the next plane out of it because I, I obviously struck a struck a nerve. <laughs> but what I didn't know at the time, and what you know, nobody told me. If you remember the the pictures you see of Elvis as a little child. He's wearing those bib overalls. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and so I'm certain that, and it seems like J.D. or somebody said that, you know, he had said that uh, he hated those overalls for that reason. I mean, he was so poor, and I'm sure that was not a pleasant pleasant time in his life. But Mm. uh, so he really did not like those overalls. But, of course, I had no way of knowing that. Uh, And so it, it probably just... Was was some bad memories for him, but, <laughs> but I eventually uh, I eventually made it through. I didn't get fired, and I, I managed to to stay with the group. I'm sure people probably got fired for for stuff less than that. And, yeah, uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, if you just if you didn't fit in, you know, then they certainly don't want you around. I mean, it's 
because you, when you're touring like that, everybody's just so close, you know, and you're together all the time, flying or singing or in the hotels. And, uh, it's a close knit group, and so you've got to be able to 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 fit in, you know, with everybody. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it must have been a lot of fun uh, on tour, but was it tiring as well? I mean, there was a lot of going and 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 you know, r- racing here and racing there, and flights and doing the concerts and then getting to the next date. It must have been very tiring at times. Well, it it was, but fortunately, I was young, so yeah, <laughs> you know, but. The, but the shows were so exciting, and the the audience was was so energetic and and uh, so loud and booming, and uh, you know that just gave you the energy and, and and the excitement to just want to be a part of it. So you would kind of forget that you were um, you would forget that you were tired. It was it was too much fun to, to you know we'd go until we dropped. Yeah, yeah. Um, Elvis, I mean, he loved all singers, but I do feel that um, he had a soft spot for a lovely low bass like JD's and like yours. Um, did he ever kind of bring you in to the to the show and give you a spotlight? You know, he did. Um, and this was after, this was like the about the last year that I was with him. Mm-hmm. Um, he, uh, one night in Vegas at the... He always loved something at, at different points in the show, and even in his own songs and in his voice, he would, you know, he would always drop down, you know, and hit a low, hit a low note, a low for him, mm. uh, just playing around, you know. He would, he would do that in a lot of songs. And one night in Vegas, he was, he was doing um, "It's Now or Never," and when he got to the end of that song, um, he was going to. He did it's now or never my love will wait. And then you drop down it's now or never my love will wait. Well he would he was gonna do that himself, but he 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 his voice wasn't deep enough to do that. And he stopped the whole show. He just wait a minute, you know, just shut up down the orchestra and everything. Uh-huh. And he looked over at me and he said, Larry, sing that line for me. And I went, you know, it's now or never my love will wait. <laughs> um, and then he said, "Okay, from now on, uh, that's going to be your line." You know, like, oh, this is right in the middle of the show, right? And so from that point on, from that point on, every, every concert when he did that song and got to the end of it, I would, I would sing that line for him, and and he would always recognize him and he started calling me his alter ego. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, yeah, that was a little bit of a, a spotlight thing for me. You were uh, you were one of the youngest uh, in, in the whole group, weren't you? Yeah, you know, I was I was the last last person hired, you know, by the by the show. Mm. Um, there was no other, no other singers or playing musicians brought in after me. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm the youngest. And were there many other pranks on on tour? You were saying about you know him calling you the farmer and everything like that. But I'm sure Elvis liked to play pranks, uh, you know, during during the tour and things like that. Uh, did, were you ever on the tail end of any other pranks, or do you know any other pranks that he played on people? Um, you know, he did he do wild stuff one night when we were rec- we were doing the recordings at, at Graceland. Oh the, yeah, the jungle the jungle room recordings. He wasn't quite ready to record, and it was in the wintertime. It was freezing cold, and he decided he was going to ride, ride one of his motorcycles. And, and he got uh, Tony Brown, you know, the keyboard player, had him come out and get on the back of the motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget when they come back, and Tony Brown walked in, and his hair was all over the place, man. And he had this, had this deer in the headlight look, you know, just scared to death. And he said, man, that is... That's the worst thing that ever happened to me. Getting on the back of that motorcycle, it's freezing cold, <laughs> and Elvis just screaming, you know, down the road. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't uh, volunteer or be be in line to to be able to to be the one selected to go on that ride. But, um, and there were some there were some jokes that he pulled one night. Uh, they staged a. Uh, a thing, and, and it was before I joined them. You may have heard the story about up in the, up in the uh, suite in the, in, in Vegas. 
the, the bodyguards, they, they cooked up a scheme of talking about they'd had some threats oh, yeah. on uh, Elvis's life and mm-hmm. um, and that kind of thing. And, and the stamps, I, I wasn't with them, but stamps were up there all, you know, because they were all standing around singing gospel stuff. And all of a sudden, somebody comes through the door and starts shooting a gun, shooting blanks, and uh, scared the crowd. If you ever talk to Ed, Ed Enoch or Bill Bays or any of the guys still around from the stamps, they'll tell you that story. <laughs> it's the most frightening thing they've ever been a part of. Wow. Because they, they didn't know. I mean, they, they built it up so good, they thought that there really was a threat on Elvis's life. Somebody was coming through the door shooting. Wow. Wow. You can imagine trying to tell that film. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just you, you actually mentioned the Jungle Room sessions there, and a couple of fans have asked me uh, if can you remember where Elvis stood or sat when he was doing the Jungle Room recordings? Because some people have said he was dead center in the room. Somebody else said he was near the kitchen. Can you remember where he was during those sessions? Yeah. Um Right, right where the steps come down from upstairs, which Ooh. is kind of to the, it's kind of on the kitchen side. Mm. He was right there because I remember when he walked down the steps, his mic was his, his mic and his mic stand was was right there as he came down the steps. Mm. So just in that in that general area, although at times you know he didn't stand in one place, he would he would take that microphone off the off the stand, and he would walk around the room, you know, which. If you can, I'm sure if you know anything about recording music, they had to have driven the engineers in the in the truck. They had to have been going crazy, you know, with with, with him walking around. And yeah. One minute they got too much too much drums in the mic, or then they got too much singers in the mic. Because mm-hmm. in in a normal studio, you know, you you have everything isolated. All the vocals are isolated. All the instruments are isolated. And certainly, Elvis would be isolated. But we had none of that in the jungle room. And, you know, how those records turned out as good as they did is just a mystery. I'm still, you know, they, they, they took the recordings and went, took them into a studio and to mix, you know, and so I'm, I'm sure in the mixing process they were able to clean up, you know, a lot of the tracks and, and make them cleaner where there's not so much bleed over from everything else. And, yeah. But yeah. I think they're great, they're great records, man. I, I love listening to them. Yeah. I mean, he did a fabulous version of Hurt. Um, in, in, in the jungle yeah, room that, sessions, that was his, yeah. You know that was the first song that he sang uh-huh. of, of those of those recordings on that night, and I, I will never forget. Um, he came down and he's just a little bit of conversation, and then you know he said, "Let's you know let's record," and they cranked down on that song, man. And he he reared back and sang that song like he had been singing it his whole life. You know, it was like. How, how did he do that? Is this is this a song he's been singing for years and just nobody knew about it? I mean, he sang it so well. I think we only we only made the, like two takes on the song, mm. and, and and that was a record. I mean, he just was did it so well the very first time. It was amazing. Uh, so, some of the uh, some of the notes he hits during that song are almost operatic. Well, I know, I know. It'll, it'll, it'll hurt your head if you're standing close by. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, his it's, range was just, his range was unbelievable. Mm. Uh, it's it's a pity he didn't do a studio version of Unchained Melody as well, which he started doing near the end of his life. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the the one uh, that was shown in uh, the CBS Elvis in concert um, from Rapids mm-hmm. from Rapid City. I mean that's just some performance. Yeah. It's it really is some performance. Do you, do you think? Yeah. Uh, do you think? I mean, he did a few uh, sort of almost like autobiographical um, numbers in the Jungle Room. Uh, one was "It's Easy for You," and he, he could almost have been singing about his own personal life in that, couldn't he? Yeah, uh, of course. No, there was never any of that kind of discussion, you know, um, in, in going into the song just to. Um, you know why that particular one or whatever he was, he was just like kind of like he was on automatic pilot and just you know sing one and move on to the next and mm. he I think he was in the in, in the mindset of uh, not really wanting to 
to have to do the recording, you know, because they, they, they tried to get him to come to Nashville. Hmm. And he actually did come to Nashville, but he never recorded. I think he stayed here for a day and then he went back home. But, um, and so the, that was the only way that RCA could get him to record was to send that mobile truck over and, so he could do it at home. So um, it, it, it wasn't a lot of a lot of talking. I mean, it was just, it was strictly down to business and sing those songs, and there, there wasn't uh, much else that I can say about it. I think he was he was in fairly lighthearted mood though because I've heard a few of the outtakes and a little bit of the studio chatter and he, he does he does seem fairly happy he's kind of joking around with the with the your you know you your the singers and and the, the band and so forth. Yeah, no, he he, he was. Um, I'm I'm talking about in general, you know. Yeah. So once he actually came down into the into the room and started singing, you know, I mean everything everything lightened up. He lightened up and. Uh, because music was that was what he was all about. That's what what he loved, and so that 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 part of it was making him happy, you know. And he was he was enjoying that. I think we all know though that uh, his his dream was to be in a gospel quartet, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the story is that when he was about eighteen, he this group that J.D. Sumner was actually a part of, the Blackwood Brothers. Uh, he actually auditioned for them at some point, and of course, it wasn't that he was not a good singer, but he just wasn't uh, didn't have that particular quartet sound that that uh, everybody was looking for at that time. So he they didn't hire him, but you know I'm I'm, I'm glad that they didn't because we might not if he'd have gotten that gig. I don't know if we'd have the Elvis that we have exactly. We had it. Yeah, I'm sure everybody listening now is is breathing a sigh of relief as well that they they turned him down. Um, yeah. it, you know, I, I mean, we know from a very very early stage when he went into the recording studio that he would warm up as well, singing gospels first before he he sort of got down to the actual recording uh, process. Uh, did he did he yeah. do that? Did he do that in front of you? Did he ever sing gospels in the studio in front of you? Um. No, we didn't. I never got to do that. I know he did that a lot up upstairs in Graceland, but um, that was by the time I joined him that that had kind of stopped. Also, um, you know, he had the group uh, voice with Donnie Sumner and uh, Cheryl Nelson and those guys. They were also around all the time, and so they that that deal with voice was kind of was coming to an end, mm -hmm. and so. Um, they had kind of stopped doing that impromptu gospel singing around the piano. I, I hate that I missed that, but there's a little part I wanted, but I'm kind of glad I did because they would be up to four or five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> all the other guys are going, Oh my Lord, I want to go to bed so bad. But you know, he stayed up all night anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he would, he would wear the guys out, but it, but it was fun for them. I mean, they, obviously they loved it. Yeah, we we actually see him singing uh, with the Stamps in Elvis on tour, uh, "Bosom of Abraham" mm -hmm. and "Lead Me, Guide Me" and all that. And it, it, that's that's around the piano in the recording studio. It's uh, and, and they they look like they're having a great time. Um, oh yeah. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, 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 we know that he he he, he thought very highly of uh, J.D. and uh, that yes. that's that's some. He was the lowest bass singer in the world, wasn't he? At one time, he was. He was as far as I, he was actually in the Guinness Book of World Records as, as having hit the lowest note, you know, on record, the human human sound. Yeah, yeah. And he was just, um, you know, he was he was just a freak of nature. The only thing I can say. Of <laughs> course, he was. Virginia was real tall and slender, and you can imagine his his vocal cords were probably. Uh, you know, six or eight inches long. I mean, I'm making that up, but <laughs> they, had to be, they had to be really long for him to sing yeah. those low notes like it. And he could, I mean, I'm, I can sing pretty low, and he, he could, he would sing an octave under me. Yeah. In, in fact, that was part of our, when we would do our gospel shows, that was part of our, part of our show or part of our shtick, you know, would be, we would do a song that had a, had a bass lead in it of some kind, and, and I would sing it. Uh, and then they would do it again, and J.D. would push me out of the way and sing it an octave under me. <laughs> so obviously I had to 
I had to let go of any ego that I had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People said that when he when when he hit his Zoom base, you know, the, the the dive bomber thing that Elvis asked him to do during "I Got a Woman," you could nearly feel the yeah. whole building uh, vibrating. Yeah, you could. <laughs> In fact, you know that that was a big part of the gospel music. And when I started going as, as a child, they would have the bass vocal up loud enough that you would you would you would feel your your seat vibrate. Wow. Um, when it hit those super low notes, and that, that was what really got my attention. It was like, holy smoke, and I, want to, I want to do that. I want to be part of that. It was that kind of thing that just goes right through you. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that became a big part of, um, of Elvis's concerts. I mean, there were several songs that, El, that J.D. Would, would do those bass, uh, those bass slides on. And it just kind of... Uh, just you know, and, and they were most mostly on the big ballads, um, and it just really would put a, a nice little ending to all those uh, all those big ballads when they hit that low note. Yeah, yeah. The last couple of years, I mean, everybody realizes and, and can see that Elvis wasn't well. Do you do you think that uh, maybe he he was overworked at the end and he should have taken time off? Could you see it, uh, you know, from close proximity, watching him every night on stage? You know, we we basically didn't see it because we were with him so much. We, I look back now at some of the photos, you know, from the, from the '77, a few months a few months before he passed, and some of the shows we did, and I, I see. I mean, we just didn't. We we could tell he was a little overweight, mm -hmm. but we, you know, we just never thought that there was any huge problem um it just never occurred to us because we were with him so much and we, we just didn't see that we didn't see that there was a gradual change apparently and we just didn't see it that much mm. and he still was singing great you know and he was having still having fun on stage and um i only remember a couple of a couple of shows you know where he didn't seem like he was you know where he was not 100 percent and and uh he would shade some of the high notes you know or not or not even sing them and, and yeah. that kind of thing you know but, yeah um but for the most part you know the shows were great he was he was singing great and he was still elvis we just didn't recognize him yeah. you know his physical problem was as bad as it was his voice never failed him you know right to the very very end yeah. you know that's that's the that's the one thing that everybody says and i agree with it as well you were uh, oh, yeah. you were you were en route to uh, Portland in Maine when you found out that he would left us. Is that correct? <clears throat> we were we were actually in the airport and here in Nashville, um, and they were sending a plane. You know, they had a they had a plane for the for all the band and crew to travel on, and that plane was was on its way from Memphis to. Uh, to pick us up, it hadn't landed yet. We were all standing in the terminal uh, when we got a call. I don't know who it was that called, but uh, Felton Jarvis, you know who Felton was. Yeah. Uh, Felton took the call and kind of turned around to all of us, had a, had a strange look on his face, and said, "Guys, uh, tours canceled. Go home." And that's all he said. He didn't say, you know, any other details or anything. Just, just the tour was canceled. So, um, we got in our cars and headed home and then we heard that he had died on, on the radio like everybody else, mm, which was kind of shocking. But, uh, I guess they didn't want to tell all of us there at the airport and, and they wanted to have it come out all at one time or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but that was, uh, that was the way that happened. Um, you know, it, it's it's evidence of how earth-shattering uh, news it was um, because everybody remembers, you know, if they're old enough, they, if they were old enough in 1977, everybody remembers where they were and what they were doing when they heard the news that Elvis Presley had died. It's like people remember mm -hmm. where they were. If they were old enough, you know, when JFK was shot, uh, the Challenger disaster, 9-11, yeah. you know, all those... 
all those earth shattering events and people remember where they were and what they were doing when they when they heard about Elvis dying. Yes, that's true. And uh, you know, e- e- even today, you know, when I think about it, I still get the shiver up my spine, and and uh, it's just to me, it's still one of the saddest things, one of the saddest days I can ever remember. Yeah, it, it was for us as well. You know, we immediately, well, not immediately, but it, it wasn't long after that we get the call to to come to uh, to Memphis, and um, Vernon had asked JD, you know, to help put together the, the whole funeral thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and J.D. was, you know, was the one that got uh, Rex on board and, was, and uh, decided for the music. And, you know, we were, we, we stood behind his casket in the in the living room there in Graceland and sang, uh, you know, we sang uh, several, several songs. How Great There Are was one of them. He Touched Me was another, and I can't remember the other. It seemed like it was about four songs that we sang. But it's all just kind of surreal, you know. It was like you are just kind of not there. It was, it was, it was like a dream. Mm-hmm. Did you see Elvis in his casket, or was the casket closed when you got there? No, we saw him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had it open. I, I just assumed they hadn't had, but but it was. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a thing in the South here, you know. You, you, they old funerals, you know, especially older people. I mean, they have they had the casket open. Yeah, well, they do here in Ireland as well. They wake people for a couple of days. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it's yeah. it's quite a common thing through in in some in some countries. Um. Mm-hmm. So so, what 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 did you do after um after uh, Elvis died and and that the concerts were over? Well, you know, we still had we still had our gospel uh, dates and those kind of things that. That didn't that didn't stop, but uh, one of the things that started happening to us was um, uh, we started getting all these dates that weren't gospel. People, you know, that just loved Elvis hmm. would wanted us to come and do whatever we do, whatever we did. So we our show, uh, our gospel show, kind of evolved a little bit into a uh, you know. A, of different styles of music because we started, people would say, well, do, do, they'd request some songs that they knew that we had done on stage. And uh, so we were doing a kind of a, almost a variety, a variety show of, of his music and our music. And, and of course we had to add to our band. And so we were, we did a lot of, uh, for a couple of years, we, we traveled a, a lot, you know, doing, doing those kind of shows. And um, you're a married man, and you married. Yeah. You, you, you <laughs> I'm going to say something quite funny now. You married into music. You're a very musical family. W- would you tell the listeners yeah. uh, who you married? Well, uh, if anybody knows anything about country music, the, the mother daughter duet with Judge Naomi Winona. Um, you know, and I, I met. I met Naomi. She had only been in town about a month, you know, for her and her and the girls, her and and their other daughter Ashley, who was quite famous as well. Yes. Um, they had just come to town. Ashley was eleven, and Monona was fifteen, and 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 Naomi got a job working in a our management office. And I walked in the door one day, and she's sitting there at the reception desk, you know. And so the rest is kind of kind of history from there. I mean, we, started dating and and uh we've been together for about 40 years now and uh you've also very recently i believe uh recorded a album called legacy yeah i did you know there was a couple of producers here in town that had been after me for years to you know to do a, a, a solo project and i I've always just been part of a part of a group, part of a quartet. Every every recording that I've ever done has always been as a member of a, of a quartet and just singing the bass part, you know, with a few lead parts here and there. And it, it just never dawned on me or it, it, that I wanted to just go do a solo record. So I I just never did. And then um, not long ago, we lost 
Ed Hill, you know, our, bar- our baritone singer. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And uh, other people um, that was part of uh, my, my life was starting to, was starting to lose them. And, and I just thought, you know, well, I, I'm not going to write a book. And people had asked me a lot, are you going to write a book about your time with Elvis? And I didn't feel like that I had anything new to write about, you know, or anything, any kind of revelation, you know, or whatever that would make a book interesting. And I, and I, I certainly wasn't going to make up stuff, you know, just to make a book. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I thought, you know, well, I do need something that kind of represents who I am to, to leave behind as, as my legacy, you know? And, uh, so I, I went in the studio and recorded, uh, several of the old gospel songs that Elvis sang. Some of me recorded, some of me didn't. He was just singing, he'd just sing them around the piano. Um, and so that's that's how that came about, yeah. And uh, it's available on your uh, website, isn't it? I can actually give that now. It's LarryStricklandMusic.com. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and uh, there's there's samples of each track on there as well, 30-second samples. I was li- actually listening to some yesterday, and uh, it's it's really great, really great, and that great uh, deep well, voice. <laughs> I just Thank you. It. Well, you know, that's the bad. That's the bad thing about being a bass singer, man. When you, you know, when you got a low voice, there's not there's not much else you can sing. You can you can't go hit a high note here and there. You, you don't have it. You, know? you can hit low notes all day long. But, um, when you when you're a bass singer, that's 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 your lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that's probably why you uh, admire Elvis because you were saying he had such a fantastic range. So uh, you were yeah. you were you were probably <laughs> you were probably a little envious of Elvis, but then again, who wouldn't be? <laughs> absolutely, no, absolutely. He was he was without a doubt the, the the greatest vocal that certainly that I've ever been aware of, and then to be on stage and those shows, man, with the full orchestra and all the singers on there, it was just. I mean, it was an unbelievable sound, you know, filling mm. a filling a hall, and you know, and it's. And then you add the excitement of the crowd to it. It's just, just an unbelievable experience to be in the center of that. You know, it's, it's, I feel so fortunate to have gotten to do that. As, as I said, I did over 200 yeah. concerts with him. And yeah. so it was like that every single one. And the excitement never really waned, did it? I mean, every night he walked on stage was like seeing him for the first time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You couldn't but help, you know, just... It was a big, big smile and a, and a big, a great feeling. I, I can tell by I, I can tell by the way you're talking about him. You, you, you're glad you met him, uh, and I think you know every, everybody that came in touch with Elvis and, and knew him and met him. Their their life was always just that little bit better after meeting him. I think. Oh yeah, and and you know the memories that I have of, of during that time, and it's. Uh, they're, they're serving me really well here in my old age, you know. <laughs> we, um, another uh, person connected with Elvis, and a, a great man, and I know he was a great friend of yours as well, was Mac Davis. We lost Mac recently, oh. didn't we? Yes, we did. Mac, he and Lisa, his wife, moved to, moved to our area here in Tennessee about five years ago from, L, from L.A., um, and he literally lived almost within walking distance of, of our home. And we got to be really good friends and played golf a lot. And then we we do a poker game every Wednesday night. And he would he was part of our our poker guys. And and uh, man, we, he had so many stories of you know his time, uh, uh, the, the songs that he wrote and and uh, the things that he did. You know, he had his own TV show at one time. And, uh, but wrote unbelievable songs, you know, uh, memories and in the ghetto and a little less conversation. I mean, just great, great songs that, that Mike wrote. And he was such a sweetheart of a guy. We we really miss him. Yeah, I mean, he, he was he was definitely on my uh, my list as somebody to contact and speak to. And unfortunately. Mm. Uh, we just ran out of time. I, I know you've said yourself as well that uh, we, we're, we're losing somebody from the Elvis world nearly every year now, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we sure are. Um, so it's... Um, uh, yeah, it's, I just hate, I hate to even think about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then the, we had the, had the 
COVID thing this year, so we had to cancel all our all our stuff that we do at Graceland. Yeah. Uh, every year, so, so that it's been a it's been a very trying year for everybody, I think, hasn't it? It really has. It really has. We're going to look back on this year and we're going to go, what the hell happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and there's not going to be anything. That we, there's, there's not going to be any great members that we want to take no. with us. You know, no. I mean, there there is re- re- recently there's good news about a, a vaccine should be available in, in the coming months. But, uh, you know, it can't it can't come soon enough. That's for sure. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, uh, Larry, it's it's really been lovely speaking to you. You're you're an absolute gentleman. You really are. And thanks for taking the time out to uh, share your Elvis stories with us. Uh, it's been a bit emo- it's it's been a bit em- emotional for me as well at times. You could probably hear from my voice at times, especially you know that the, the, the last few years of Elvis's life, you know, it, it was emotional. Um, so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, well, thank you very very much for 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 allowing me to uh, to speak to you. Well, thank you for for letting me talk about it because I I love to, I love talking about that time and talking about him and and my experiences. It's it's great to get to relive that any time I can. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, you and Naomi and all your loved ones stay safe during this uh, trying time. And uh, maybe we'll yeah. speak again sometime. Any time, man. Just give me a call. Let me know. Thanks very much. Take care of yourself. Yes, thank you. Yes, Thanks. You too, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks once again to Larry for joining me on the show today. You can purchase his new Legacy album on his website, LarryStricklandMusic.com. You can contact me by email at ElvisTheUltimateFanChannel at gmail.com and on Facebook and Twitter. All my podcasts are available on all good podcast providers such as Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Google Podcasts, Stitcher and iHeartRadio to name just a few. Thanks for listening and I hope you'll join me next time for another episode from Elvis the Ultimate Fan Channel Podcast.